This is all? Yeah. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد brothers and sisters in islam detoxification is a physiological as well as a psycho spiritual process of removing toxic substances from the human body. These toxins can be artificial poisonous chemicals or artificial thoughts that we create ourselves that tend to have lasting effects on our bodies and our hearts and our psychological well-being. In Islam, the seat of virtue is the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبَ الَّتِي فِي السُّدُورِ That don't they travel through the earth and see what was the end result of the people that came before them? And don't they have ears with which they hear and eyes with which they see? For indeed it is not the eyes that go blind but it is the heart that is in the chest. It is the heart that is in the chest. In Islam, emphasis, great emphasis is placed on the heart. And that is because the reason why they didn't see was not because of the physical 
or the lack of the physical aptitude to see, but of the spiritual aptitude to understand and grasp the things that are around them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, In the fil jasadi na mudra, ida salahat salah al jasadu kullu, wa ida fasad al fasad al jasadu kullu, ala wa hi al qalb. That indeed in the body there's a lump of flesh, that if it's sound, then the whole body will be sound. If it's healthy, if it's sound, then the rest of the body will be likewise. And that if it's a corrupt and it is unhealthy, then the rest of the faculties will be corrupt and unhealthy. And indeed, that lump of flesh is the heart. So while when we hear the term detox, we're usually talking about detoxifying our body from poisonous chemicals, substances that as human beings we tend to consume and that eventually end up consuming us. My concentration is on the det detoxification of your heart and your soul, of the thoughts that we put into our minds and the beliefs that we begin to adopt that, be that tend to corrode our thinking and to corrode our hearts, uh, ending up in some of the actions that we find ourselves doing. Sometimes our thoughts and subsequently our actions create unnecessary obstacles for ourselves in our lives and it completely obstructs us from our own path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or our own path to you know material success and then we become our worst enemy while we blame our failures on everybody else sometimes we have to challenge our thinking sometimes we have to ask ourselves why do I believe that why do I believe that why have I adopted this belief that has become self destructive to me that has become self-obstructing to my own personal success and then we blame everybody else for our failures and our faults it's the white man it's the system it's this it's that and we never stop to think about the fact that it might just be you did you ever stop to think about that maybe it's not your baby mother maybe it's not the system maybe it's not you know maybe it's not the government Maybe it's not the white man. Maybe it's just you. Maybe it's just the thoughts that you harbor in your mind that be begins to corrupt and corrode your heart, which manifests in the way that you interact with the world that is around you. But we can't do that because then that would mean we would have to do some serious reflection on ourselves. We would have to do some serious introspection. And it's easier for us to continue playing the victim because as long as you victimize, you never have to look at you as being part of the problem. It's always somebody else's problem. It's always somebody else's fault. That's what victimizing does. And you victimize to your own detriment, not to the detriment of anyone else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the same mentality in the story of Adam and Shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said to Shaitan, He said to Iblis, Ma mana'aka and alla tasjud id amartuk. What prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you to? Life as we know it is filled with a lot of do's and don'ts, whether in the religion of Islam or whether outside of the religion of Islam. As a responsible adult, you live your life within certain parameters. People come to Islam and say, oh, there's so many do's and don'ts. There's do's and don'ts on your job. There's do's and don'ts in school. There's do's and don'ts in your own household. Where do you think all of these do's and don'ts come from? They come from divine revelation, whether the Quran or the revelations that preceded it. That's just life. That's part of being responsible. In what world can you just walk into anything or any place and just do what you want to do? It doesn't work like that. That's not how responsible adults function. We function under parameters, guidelines, rules, regulations. That is what makes us responsible, successful adults. What makes us childish and irresponsible is when we believe that the world revolves around us and I should be able to do and say whatever I want to do and say. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks Iblis, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you to? And Iblis responded by, I'm better than him. You created me from fire, you created him from dirt. Not realizing that dirt is lowly so it stays humble while fire rises, which is where his arrogance comes from. So sometimes the thing that we think makes us better than someone else is actually the thing that makes you worse than others. 
and the things that many of us are insecure about that we believe that makes us so lowly and less than others is actually the thing that makes you better than others. You just have to recognize that. You just have to see it as such. Reverse your thinking. Many of the things that we are insecure about, many of the things that, we, that make us feel inferior, because no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. You give people permission to make you feel inferior. You have to reverse that process. Detoxify yourself from these thoughts that continue to make you your own worst enemy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to shaitan, قَالَ فَهْبِتُ فَهْبِتْ مِنْهَا فَمَا يَكُونُ لَكَ أَن تَتَكَبَّرَ فِيهَا فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَخْرُجْ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الصَّاغِنِينَ Allah said to shaitan, get out of here, get out of paradise. فَمَا يَكُونُ لَكَ أَن تَتَكَبَّرَ فِيهَا It is not for you to be arrogant here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only mutakabbir. He is the only one allowed to have pride. We don't compete with Allah in that. As a matter of fact, the Prophet sallallahu said that Allah said that pride is my cloak. Al-kibriya ridai That pride is my cloak. Wa'azamati. And greatness is my, my, my garment. And that whoever competes with me in any one of those two, I will break his back. Kasaratu dahrahu. I will break your back. Greatness and pride. Those are only two qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowed to have solely. That we try to emulate the qualities of Allah all throughout our lives. Mercy, compassion, forbearing, right? All of these different qualities. But when it comes to al-kibriya, when it comes to pride, when it comes to azma, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-azim. Human being, you are not azim. You are not great. And anyone who professes to be such, watch how their demise slowly but surely creeps upon them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept no competition in the things that are specific to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't even accept competition in the things that we believe is specific to us. This is where jealousy comes from. Jealousy is a fear that is premised, that is based upon a person competing with us in something that we believe is solely ours. That is where jealousy comes from. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept no competition in the qualities that are specifically to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said to Shaitan, get out of here. It is not for you to be arrogant here. Fakhruj in the kamina sahirin. Remove yourself from here, for indeed you are of the lowly. And Shaitan he replied, Qala anzirni ila yawmi yubaathun. Give me respite until the day that they are resurrected. And Allah said to him, In the kamina al munzarin, you are granted respite. You have been granted respite. Qala fabima aghwaitani la aku udanaka la aku udanna. لَهُمْ صِرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ And Shaitan said, because you put me out of paradise, I will lie and wait on your straight path, and I will lead every single one of them astray. But notice Shaitan taking no responsibility for himself. قَالَ فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي Because you, God, you did this to me. You put me out of paradise. Seeing no mistake of his own, and this is many of us today. We don't see anything that I did wrong. It's always someone else's fault. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us in many places in the Quran not to be self-destructive. And that is either through our actions or the thoughts that create the actions that become self-destructive for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ مِلَ التَّهْلُكَ وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ and do not let your own hands be the cause of your own destruction. Don't be self-destructive. Don't let your own hands be the cause of your own destruction and do good. For indeed Allah loves those who are good doers. Do not let your own hands be the cause of your own destruction. Meaning do not become consumed by your own toxicity. Some of us are toxic. And we are consumed by our own toxicity. And we begin to uh, infect everyone around us because we are toxic. In this climate of self-absorption and grandiose delusions of self, we live in a very narcissistic personality disorder climate. Where everybody sees themselves as being larger than life. 
And a lot to blame, or largely the blame for this is social media. Everybody's a rapper now. Everybody's an artist, right? Everybody's, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, come creating your own film and doing this and do doing great things. Mashallah. There's no more little people anymore. Everybody is great. This is the society that we live in. And we need to detox ourselves from ourselves. Sometimes we need to take a step back and just come to the realization that we're not as great as we think we are. We're not as great as we think we are. The soul is such that if you leave it unchecked, it has the potential to create a very unhealthy environment for you and for the people that are around you. Great emphasis in Islam has been placed on the condition of the soul. And I'm always, I've always been amazed from the moment I took my shahad and I became a Muslim. I've always been amazed at Muslims, particularly African American Muslims, who put so much emphasis on trivial matters in the religion, matters that are important. Everything in the religion is important, but everything has its place. But we place so much great emphasis on things that are so insignificant, like raising the pants above the ankle and growing a beard. These things are small in comparison to good character. Small, insignificant almost, in comparison to something like good character. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah gives the dunya, in Allah yu'ti a dunya, man yuhib wa man la yuhib, that Allah gives the dunya to those whom he loves and those whom he doesn't love. Wa la yu'ti a deen illa man yuhib, but he only gives deen to those whom he loves. And the word deen here, the scholars explain, does not mean religion, but Allah gives good character to those whom he loves, because good character is deen. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, good character, a khuluq al-hasan, huwa deen kulla, that good character is the entire religion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, innama jittu li utamima makarim al-akhlaq, my only mission was to perfect moral character. Almost if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't have any other mission, any other goal as being a prophet and a messenger other than to perfect moral character. And here we are, pants above the ankles, huge beards, henna in the beard, mashallah, prostration mark, and have some of the most horrible characters. Some of the most disrespectful individuals you could come across are Muslims, your own Muslim brothers and sisters. Disrespectful on levels that outside of Islam, quiet is kept, a lot of people would not have the audacity to be as disrespectful as they are. Outside of Islam, Wallah al Islam has saved many lives. Many lives. And I'm not saying that from a tough guy position. I'm saying that from a realistic position. People who come into Islam, killers who come into Islam and try to change their lives are challenged by ignoramuses who come into Islam and use the religion and abuse the religion to take advantage of people who are trying to sincerely change their lives. The worst thing that you can do is wake up a sleeping giant. That's the worst thing that you can do. You push the wrong button, you will bring out a different side of a person. And we don't realize that. And we do it all the time with the horrible characters that we have. We put so much emphasis on such insignificant things and we are the only group of people that does that. You run into people from other cultures, they have some of the best characters. Maybe his pants is dragging on the ground, maybe he doesn't have a beard. Some of the most profound characters, man, subhanAllah, invite you over, feed you, would give you the last thing off of their backs would give the last piece of clothing that they have to you. I've run into people that are like this, and according to our standards, we would consider them almost on the brink of being kuffar because they don't have a beard or their pants is not above their ankles. While you see Muslims today with pants above their ankles, but you got a, 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 a whiskey bottle in your back pocket, you're carrying a pistol that is unregistered, unlicensed, Someone that you, you bought the gun from somebody else who God knows best what he's done with it. But your pants is above the ankle. 
You can regurgitate slogans and phrases and jargon that you heard other so-called on it Muslims say. And as long as you're within that little box, you're accepted. And we've accepted that as our practice of Islam. Wallah ala you toxic, man. You toxic to yourself and you toxic to the ummah because for an outsider to look in and see that as Islam, it's a complete turn off. If that is what you consider Islam, I'm good where I am. I'm good. I don't need to leave my life to come into being a part of a cult where this is the best that you can offer. And I mean, we have to really take a look at that, man. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned us about the danger of the soul, that when we leave the soul to itself and we don't work to purify the soul from the toxins that corrupt the soul, the soul will consume us and create a very unhealthy environment for us and an unhealthy environment for the people that are around us. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِسُوءٌ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي that indeed the soul naturally inclines towards evil. That's the, soul, that's the nature of the soul. If you leave it, it'll consume you. If you don't work towards purifying your soul, your soul will consume you. Indeed, the soul naturally inclines towards what is evil. Unless you restrict it. Unless you wage war against your own soul. Ibn Qayyim said, Man lam yujahid aduwahu fil batin, lam yujahid aduwahu fil kharij. That he who does not wage war against his internal enemy, you will never be able to wage war against your external enemy. Never. You will lose every battle. He who knows himself and knows his enemy need not worry about the result of a thousand battles. But he who does not know himself and that not, does not know his enemy, he will succumb every single time. So, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, لا يسيء الظن بنفسه إلا من عرفها ومن أحسن ظن بنفسه فهو من أجهل الناس بنفسه Ibn Qayyim said, no one thinks lowly of himself except the person who knows who his true self is. No one thinks lowly of himself except the person who really knows himself. And the person who thinks highly of himself is from the most ignorant of people about his own self. About his own self. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu taught us to implore Allah, to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own soul. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sharri nafsi wa min sharri shaitan wa min sharri shiriki. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the evil of myself. Min sharri nafsi. I seek refuge with you from the evil of myself. Sometimes we get ourselves in situations and we are afraid, not necessarily of the world around us, but afraid of me. Many brothers coming home from prison, come home from prison, not that they are afraid of the world, but they are afraid of themselves in that world. I know me. And I know what I'm capable of given a certain situation or circumstance. You are afraid of yourself because you know you. And then there are those of us who think highly of oh, I would never do that. And you'd be the same one knee deep in that situation. But you're the one that say, I would never do that. Astaghfirullah, I billah. You think so highly of yourself. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And you're from the most ignorant of people about himself. A person who knows himself knows not to put himself in certain situations because he knows, she knows that given the right circumstance, given the right situation, I may fall victim to this or that. So we are encouraged to implore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sharri nafsi. I seek refuge with you from the evil of myself. Wa min sharri shaitan. From the evil of shaitan wa shariki and his partners. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Al-Kaysu man dana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'd al-mawt wal-ajiz man atba'a nafsahu wa yatamanna ala Allah al-amani. He said that the Kayis al-Fatin, the smart person, the intelligent person, is the one who constantly finds fault with himself and always does what is going to give him a better home in the hereafter. 
But the adage is the lazy person is the one who follows his every desire and then turn around and says, Allah is going to have mercy on me. Allah is going to be merciful to me. You're self-deluded. You think that you can just do you in this life and then come on the day of judgment and Allah is going to treat you like those who stay within the parameters of his obedience? Allah says in the Quran, Are we going to treat those who were mujrimeen, those who were criminals, those who followed their lust and their desires in every realm? Are we going to treat them like those who were muslimin, those who submitted themselves, their whole self to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What's wrong with you and how you judge? You think we're going to deal with them the same? They're not the same. They're not the same. Another uh, dua the Prophet Sallallahu taught us, and this is as we're moving closer to the month of Ramadan, we should be working towards purifying our souls so that we can actually enjoy the month of Ramadan. Some people wait all the way up into the day of Ramadan and then start to work on themselves. I'm going to work on myself until Ramadan. And what you end up doing is wasting the whole Ramadan working on yourself, whereas if you would have prepared ahead of time, you could actually enjoy the month of Ramadan because you've properly prepared. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. You prepare properly, you never have to worry about failing miserably. But then there are those of us who say, you know, I can't wait the Ramadan because I'm going to get myself together. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. You're not going to get yourself together. You're self-deluded. You're fooling yourself. It's a joke. It's something that we say to ourselves every year and we still exit the month of Ramadan, the same poor souls that we were when we went into it. The same people. Which is why the Prophet Sallallahu said when Jibreel made the dua that whoever enters into the month of Ramadan and then exit and still does not earn the forgiveness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then away with him. There's no good in him. Because if you're not going to do it in Ramadan you're not going to do it in any other time. The gates of Jannah are open. The gates of paradise, the gates of Jannah are open. The gates of the hellfire are closed. Most of the shayateen are chained up. The, the, reward, the rewards are multiplied. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making, facilitating for you the ease. And we still don't take advantage of it in Ramadan. If you're not going to do it in Ramadan, you're not going to do it at all. If all of these conveniences have been given to you to make your experience with the month of Ramadan easy and you're not going to take advantage of it, then you're not going to do it any other time anyway. No good in you. So we are living in a time of, you know, artificiality. And we have to make sure that our souls do not fall victim to the climate that we live in. The Prophet ﷺ taught us to say, Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha wa zakkiha anta khayro man zakkaha anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. Oh Allah, ati nafsi taqwaha. Give my soul its taqwa. Give my soul the nourishment that it needs, which is taqwa. That is the cure, the medicine that we need in this society. We need taqwa, we need God consciousness to constantly be aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ati nafsi taqwaha. Give my soul its taqwa. Anta khayra min zakaha. You are the best of those to purify my soul. There's none that can purify your soul better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has the remedy to all of the diseases that we have created within our souls. You are its wali, you are its guardian, and its protector. Give my soul what it needs. And this shows us, as the scholars explain, that we don't know necessarily what's good for us. And we put that in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, you know what's best for me. Give me what I need. Give my soul what it needs in order to succeed in this life. Give my soul what it needs in order to stay steadfast on your path. You know better than I do. Putting that, here again, recognizing your weakness and putting it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So while we are living in this, you know, this time of artificiality where everything from embryos to egos are man-made and manufactured, we're creating these, these images of ourselves through social media, right? And don't let social media get you jammed up, man. Don't be on social media one way, knowing that's not really who you are, and then walk out into the world with the, the profile that you got on so, social media. Your social media profile and your street profile are two totally different things. Don't confuse the two. You get yourself hurt like that. Your profile, your profile 
on social media, right? You marry, you this, you five six, you two hundred and fifty pounds, right? And you really five four, a hundred pounds soaking wet, right? And then you come out into the world with the mentality of social media. You commenting on people's pages, tough guy talk on behind the keyboard, and then you come out into the real world and you run into people in the real world and they show you, put you back in your place and make you realize that this guy and this guy are two totally different people. You're two totally different people. We fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in public and in private. Behind the keyboard and in front of the keyboard. Behind this, I'm, I'm amazed, man, as Muslims, some of the, the, the horrible things that we do to one another as Muslims. We'll go create a fake page, a fake profile pic, a fake name, and then only to go on somebody else's page and comment on somebody else's page. How much of a coward are you to do something like that? To write your, and then, I mean, you, then you have those of us who are bold enough to put our children involved, or involve our children in that. Abu Suhaila, Abu Maryam, Abu such and such. And you putting your children in that? Why would you want to be known as Abu whoever, one of your children, and then go on social media and act like a clown? You are saying you are the father of Medium. You are the father of Suhaila. Suhaila's father is on the internet acting like an idiot. That, that's basically what you're saying. You're putting your children in the middle of that, of your nonsense. Simply because you don't want to use your real name. So you'll use Abu such and such, Um such and such. Use your real name. Why are you hiding behind Acuna? And, I'm, and it's, 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 it's sad, man. It really is. That we don't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind the computer or in front of it. So with all of this being said, we have to understand the importance of purifying our souls from these toxins that we have digested. These thoughts these beliefs that we have about ourselves, that we are better than this person or better than that person, and I can critique and correct this person in public because I believe that I am somebody, I can do that. And all of these have to do with beliefs, thoughts that we have created on our own that are toxic, that continue to you know, corrode and, and, and corrupt our relationships with one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ما يريد الله ليجعل عليكم من حرج ولكن يريد ليطهركم وليتم نعمته عليكم لعلكم تشكرون. Allah says in the Quran that Allah does not wish to make any difficulty on you by Allah testing us and giving all of, giving us the life trials that He give in order to create a better human experience for us. Allah does not wish for us difficulty. But he only wishes But he wants to purify you These trials and tribulations And life tests and lessons that we get Are all to purify us So that he can complete his favor upon you So in turn you can turn around And be grateful to him For the lessons that he has given you For the trials that he has given you For the life experiences that he has given you and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish us for neglecting you know, the, you know, the blessings that he has given us through the trials and lessons of life that he has tested us with. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bima ja'a fihi min al-ayati wa thikri al-hakim akulu ma tisma'un astaghfirullaha li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-mu'minin min kulli dham fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إقرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله سراجا منيرا أما بعد الله سبحانه وتعالى created Adam from dirt the lowliest substance on earth he was given animalistic impulses that sometimes control him. And the only way that we could control all of these things or subdue these impulses is by a power or a force that is greater than, greater than ourselves. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and gave us a plethora, a ton of weaknesses to show us that we need someone more powerful than ourselves to help us tame and subdue our impulses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when uh, Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam was being seduced by the woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qala Yusuf alayhi salam, Qala Rabbi sijnu ahabu ilayya mimma yad'oonani ilay, wa illa tasrif anni kaydahunna asbu ilayhinna, wa la akunanna min al-salhineen, wa la akun min al-jahileen. That Yusuf, he said, Oh my Lord, prison is more dear to me than what they call me to. And if you do not turn their plot, they're planning, their trickery away from me, I may incline towards them. Showing you that he needed Allah's help in that moment. Some of us, we right there on the brink of back to using drugs. Right there on the cusp of using drugs and alcohol. Again, right on the cusp of a criminal lifestyle. Again, right on the cusp of going back to jail. Again, and we need Allah's intervention. If you do not turn this plot of this person or these people away from me, I may incline towards it. And then I will be from amongst the ignorant if I do so. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's intervention. We have to understand that there are things that are power, more powerful than we are. And we can't keep saying, well, I'm weak, make dua for me. No, make dua for yourself. Everybody has weaknesses. There's some who give in to their weaknesses and there's some who defer their weaknesses to a power greater than themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yusuf said, if you do not turn their plots away from me, I may incline towards them and be from amongst those who are ignorant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu in the Quran, وَلَوْلَا أَنْ ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِتَّ تَرَكَنُوا إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا وَإِذِنْ لَأَذَقْنَا ذِعْفِ الْحَيَاتِ وَذِعْفِ الْمَمَاتِ that if it had not been that we had strengthened your heart, O Muhammad, you would have inclined towards them. Shayin qalila, even just a little bit. And if you had done that, we would have allowed you to taste the punishment in this life as well as after your death. Here's Allah telling the Prophet ﷺ that the only reason he did not incline towards some of the, um, the accommodations that Quraysh was trying to make some of the, you know, uh, the, the, the suggestions of Quraysh is the only reason why is because of a power greater than himself. That had it not been that we strengthened your heart, showing you that even the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had human weaknesses just like anyone else, but it was divine intervention that saved him. And then you have to ask yourself, why do we keep inclining? Why do we keep succumbing? Why do we keep falling victim? Because we put too much you know, thought in ourselves. We put too much emphasis on our own prowess when in fact we don't recognize our own weaknesses. And this is why many of the dua that we are taught in Islam, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu highlights the servant's weakness. If you look at most of the dua, most of the supplications that we have in Islam, a lot of them are predicated on highlighting the servant's weakness. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, he made a very powerful dua one time. He said, Allahumma, uh, من كان اللهم لا تمنعنا لا تمنعنا خير ما عندك بشر ما عندنا Oh Allah, do not prevent us from the best of what you have because of the worst of what we have. Do not prevent us from the good that you have because of the evil that we have within us. This is Imam Ahmed, Imam of Ahlul Sunnah during his time, right? Acknowledging the weaknesses and the toxicity that lies within each and every one of us. And believe it or not, sometimes that toxicity that we have within us is what prevents the good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaching us. He said, Do not deny us, do not prevent us the good that you have because of the evil that we have. The Prophet sallallahu taught us in the dua of istikhara, Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmika wa astakdiruka bi kudratika وَأَسْأَلُكَ مِنْ فَضْلِكَ الْعَظِيمِ فَإِنَّكَ تَخْدِرُ وَلَا أَقْدِرُ وَأَنْتَ تَعْلَمْ وَلَا أَعْلَمْ وَأَنْتَ عَلَّامُ الْغُيُوبِ That in the beginning of the dua of istikhara, when we're about to make a major decision in our lives, the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to seek Allah's intervention, divine intervention. 
that before we decide to embark on something, marriage, a change of a job, relocating to another place, what, whatever major endeavor in our lives that we should seek Allah's intervention in that. Because Allah knows better for us than we know what, our, what is best for ourselves. That we say, oh Allah, I seek your assistance. I seek your choice by your knowledge. And I seek your power by your power and your control. I ask you for your great bounty. For indeed you have power and I have no power. And to taqdir wa la aqdir. You have power, I have no power. And to ta'alam wa la You know and I don't know. This is all acknowledging our weaknesses. And to al ghuyub. You are the knowledgeable of the unseen. You know what lies before. We make mistakes based upon presumptions about a future, whereas past and future don't affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what is best for us in our future, whereas we don't. That's why we make mistakes. So we put it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to decide for us. And the sad thing about it is that sometimes Allah decides for us and then we go against Allah's decision. Allah said no. And we say, no, Allah, I believe that this is better for me. I don't accept your decision. I'm going to go after it anyway. And we end up hurting ourselves. Here again, self-destructive behavior. Some of the toxins, and I'll just cover one, inshallah, before we conclude. Some of the toxins that uh, we consume or that consume us in, the ter in terms of thoughts and beliefs is the Fir'aunic God complex. Some of us, we think that we're God. And this is a toxic thought that manifests in the way that we interact with one another. I'm going to show you. And there are some people amongst us that think that they are God. They have taken the seat, a throne of their own, right, of their own making. You've created a throne, you sit on your throne, and you pass judgments on everybody. Masha Allah, tabarakallah. Because you are God, you decide. We tell people when their toba is accepted, when it's not accepted. We tell people whether they go into Jannah, whether they go into hellfire, based upon some limited understanding of an isolated text. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. How great we are, human beings. We sit from places of undeservingly, because some of us, as we pass judgment on other people, we are worse than some of the people we pass judgment on. We sit undeservingly from places of self-appointed privilege and pass judgment on others with a broad brush, mashallah. Thank Allah that you are not my God. Because the way that we judge, we just judge you with one broad stroke. Yeah, there's no good in him. One mistake, and we erase all of the good that you have ever done in your life. We do it in our marriages, we do it in our friendships. We do it in our business dealings. Violate me one time. I don't see no good that you have ever done. You're the worst person to ever step foot on this earth. For one mistake I made? No good? You don't see any of the good that I've ever done? MashaAllah. Allah says, That if the truth had been in accordance with their desires, everything in the heavens and the earth would have been corrupted. Alhamdulillah, the truth is the truth, and your desires are your desires. And one has nothing to do with the other. The Prophet wasallam, he said, he mentioned a hadith of a man who said, in Allaha, Wallahi, in Allaha la yaghfiru li fulan, that indeed Allah will not forgive so and so. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man dhal ladhi yata'ala alayya an la yaghfiru, la aghfiru li fulan, inni kad ghafartu lahu wa la aghfiru lak, that a man swears by Allah, the audacity. Here is forgiveness from the affairs of the unseen. When Allah decides to forgive or not forgive, there's a ton of things that are taken into consideration. Your intention, the action, how the, the degree of the action, how it affected other people, right? Whether it was you know something you fell victim to or something that was a continuous behavior pattern of yours. All of these things are taken into consideration. And then on top of all of that, then it's judged against the good that you did. Does the good outweigh the bad? All of these things are taken into consideration before God passes his final judgment. 
And here we are as human beings, mashallah, with a limited understanding of your why. Everybody and everything that everyone does has a why behind it. Until you walk in my shoes, don't judge what I do. Until you understand my why, why I did it. And we don't understand a person's why because if you did, then that would make you that person. Everybody has a why for why they do the things that they do. Why they say the things that they say. And here we go. Someone calls and say, hey, brother Imam, um, my, my husband just pronounced divorce on me. and I didn't do anything wrong. And he said this and that. And you're like, stuff for the law. Your brother, your, your husband is this and he's that. You just pass judgment on a man. You don't know what the situation was. You heard one side of the story. One side of the story and off you go judging the whole situation based upon tidbits of information. MashaAllah. The Prophet ﷺ said, two people come to you arguing. Do not judge the second one until you heard from the second one just like you heard from the first person. Reserve your judgment. I cannot judge your situation, sister. I don't know the whole story. Yeah, but what I'm telling you, no, what you're trying to do is influence you're trying to influence my thought process. I'm not going to let you do that. I have to hear from him just as I heard from you. It wouldn't be fair to your situation. It wouldn't be fair for to him until I've heard both of you out. But here we go because we know the sister, because we think we know the brother. Why well, I don't need to hear from him because I know that's his MO. I know uh, that's how he gets down anyway. But every situation is different, man. And if you want to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on what is correct, on what is right, then you will follow the divine guidance that was given to us in our religion and not judge people with only hearing half of the story. But a man says to another man, Wallahi, Allah will never forgive you. And Allah says, who is it that puts himself as a God before me to say that I won't forgive so-and-so? Don't ever say that somebody is not going to be forgiven. Even when the person dies, we see some of our young brothers and sisters dying in the streets, gun battles and drug deals and all this other stuff. And we're so quick to say, yeah, he's going to the hellfire. I'm not praying over him. So you know what's going to happen. You know the person's why. Maybe the person was defending themselves. Maybe the person was trying to get out of the gang and die, you know, in the process of that. The man who killed 99 people, Right on his way away from the area where he committed the crime and he dies on his way out of the situation i'm trying to get out of the gang i'm trying to get out of this clique or this crew and i end up dying in a gun battle fighting for my life and then you got some judgmental self-righteous muslim sitting here talking about you ain't gonna pray over me because you know you know the ins and outs of my why and Allah says, who puts himself as a God before me to say that I won't forgive so-and-so? Indeed, I have forgiven him and I don't forgive you for trying to play God. The judgment that you pass on other people comes back on you. Because the judgment that you ultimately make of someone else is a reflection of your own limitations. Understand how that works. People who understand their limitations, they stay away from judging because they know there's, there's too many variables. I can't give you a judgment on this person. There's too many variables. They reserve their judgment. I, I can't judge. Who am I to judge? Not only that, they're looking at themselves saying, who am I in a position to be judging somebody else? And I know the sins that I commit. I know the stuff that I do. So who am I to sit from a place of privilege and pass judgment on this person and that person? They reserve their judgment. That is from the highest level of intellect to observe, to evaluate, right? Without judgment. Last hadith, the Prophet wasallam, he said, or in another narration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says to the man, Kunta bi aliman, aw kunta aliya fi, or kunta that Allah says to the man that, do you know me? Kunt be ya aliman? You know what I'm going to do with this person? Or do you have power over what I control? Allah is the one that forgives. You got power over who Allah is going to forgive and who he's not going to forgive? Or is that totally in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man qala li akhihi ya kafir Allah 
The Prophet said, whoever says to his brother Muslim, yeah, kafir, you call your Muslim brother a kafir. Right? This is a judgment that you are making on your Muslim brother. Then, if he is as you say he is, then so be it. Meaning, if the reality of the situation is as you say it is, then that's what it is. And if not, then you are more deserving of that term than he is. Then it returns back to you. You are a reflection of the judgment that you pass on other people. Understand how that works. These are the toxic thoughts, man, that we carry and harbor in our hearts. And we have to rid ourselves of that. And I would make our ummah a much more pleasant place to be for us, for our children, if we could. And I, I mean, there was like three more things that I wanted to get to that I can't. But just this one alone is enough. Reserve your judgment, man, for people. Try to help people meet them where they are and try to help them elevate. Our job is not to judge people. We can judge actions. That's given to us in our religion to judge the action. But the person, the individual themselves, that is totally in the hands of Allah. That's not your place. That's not your place. A person did an act of kufr. We can say it's an act of kufr. But I do not, cannot say that this person is a kafir. I can't. Unless it is clear, it's clear that the person apostated from Islam, left Islam, has nothing to do with Islam. Then that's something that's clear. But for a mistake here or there, error here and there, you want to reserve your judgment and leave that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for any shortcomings that we've made. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see the month of Ramadan and to reflect on where we were this time last year and to make the necessary corrections so that we are better next year. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to see Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to see Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to see and to benefit from the month of Ramadan. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa aqim as-salaam.